We're very thankful for each and every one of you who is here. I'm very thankful that I get to stand before you and to be able to present a portion of God's Word to you. And I think this morning's lesson will be, uh, Lord willing, very interesting and enlightening to us. And uh, I'll be, look at things maybe a little bit different way than we have in the past. This morning we want to talk about what is in a name. What is in a name? And uh, as uh, our brother Josh so astutely observed, uh, this, quote, this is taken from a quote of Shakespeare. Juliet said, what is in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And her idea is that a name doesn't matter. If you call a rose something else, it's still a rose. That names don't matter, that they have no importance. And while for a lot of things, you could change the name and it wouldn't matter, but there are some things in which a name matters very, very much. As a matter of fact, uh, one area is, of course, with Jesus. The name of Jesus matters, and the names of Jesus matter. And this morning, that's what we're going to look at. We're just going to look at the names of Jesus and we're going to look at what that, what that means to us. We're going to look first at kind of like uh, his earthly life. And then we'll be looking at uh, his role in salvation and then his kingship. And so each name under these categories are, are generally in these categories. Although I'll say that the names of Jesus all have general uh, statements and feelings about them. And so there'll be a lot of overlap as we go through them. But I tried to categorize them as best I could. But the name of Jesus matters, and the names of Jesus and the titles of Jesus tell us about him and who he is, and told the Jews who was coming and what to expect from him, and today we can know what kind of relationship that we have with him. Because there are many people today who say, oh yeah, Jesus, I, I love Jesus, I believe in Jesus, and they have no clue what that means. They don't know about the titles that Jesus holds uh, as, uh, as the creator. They don't know about the things that Jesus has done. So the very first name we want to start with, of course, is the name Jesus. And uh, you say, well, that's a, a pretty good place to start. It's a pretty simple thing. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, And you shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, this seems like a very uh, obvious, simple little statement, uh, but it is so interesting to me what the name Jesus actually means. What does the name Jesus mean? You know, uh, I, your name may represent something. Uh, I think my brother's name, Ryan, means little king or something like that. There's all kinds of different names that, uh, meanings that you may have to your name. But the name of Jesus means Yahweh or God is salvation. That's what the name of Jesus means. The name of Jesus means God is salvation. And uh, that's very important because he says in our verse here, he says, for or because he, meaning Jesus, will save his people from their sins. Well, who, who is, uh, who's people? Yahweh's people, God's people. So within the name of Jesus, we see the claim to be God. Right off the bat, this phrase tells us that God is going to save his people, and Jesus, of course, fills that role, and uh, it says here that Jesus is God. All 
also, the next title we have as uh, kind of one I didn't know where to put it, but it's such an amazing passage. Uh, and that is the title of Prince of Peace. And we put it back here because it's talking about his birth. And uh, it says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so here in this, uh, we really want to look at this whole phrase that we have here, this whole verse, because right off the bat we see he says that Jesus came in the form of a man, that he was born just like you and I, that the birth itself, I mean, the conception was miraculous, but the birth itself, it wasn't anything miraculous. It was interesting because of, they couldn't find a place to have the child, but it's not that interesting because my brother was born in a car and my cousin was born in the same car. Like I have just as good a story as Jesus as far as being born. There's a, it was a regular birth. It was interesting, but there was nothing miraculous about that. That's because he was just like you and I. And then when he grew up, he was just a child, just like I have children. And going up, uh, he lived life and he had to become a carpenter's son. He had to learn carpentry. He had to learn a trade, just like you and I have to learn a trade and a job. And that means that when he died on the cross, he felt the nails into his hands just as much as you and I would having nails put into our hands because Jesus was fully human just like you and I. So right here it, it says that, but what else does it say about it? It also says he's gonna be called wonderful, that we're gonna bless the name of Jesus, that he's gonna be a counselor. And you know, people talk about the friend of Jesus. Jesus is the uh, friend in the sense that he is there to help us through troubled times and he's the ear and he's gonna listen to us. He's gonna be there with us and for us. But also it says he's going to be mighty God. Wait, I just thought you said that he grew up and was a, a, a child and had a lived a life. But it also says he's gonna be called mighty God. So again, in this prophecy in the Old Testament, we have the fully uh, humanness of Jesus and also the Godhood of Jesus. And he says, everlasting Father, again, talking about the eternity of Jesus or, or the eternality of Jesus, that he is not a lesser God or something like that. He is the eternal God. And of course, the Prince of Peace. The next one we have is the Son of Man. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, it says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. Now, you hear this phrase, the Son of Man, throughout the Bible, and a lot of times, especially if you talk to, uh, if you talk to um, uh, Islamists, they would say, oh, this shows that Jesus didn't claim to be the son of God. He claimed to be the son of man. And people who try to reject the deity of Jesus say this all the time. That, oh, he's the son of man, not the son of God. But that is really an ignorant statement because this phrase, the son of man, actually alludes back to the Old Testament. And in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, and really that whole chapter, talk about uh, what the Son of Man was or who the Son of Man would be. And it describes the Son of Man as a heavenly figure who comes down from the clouds of heaven and is given dominion and glory and power and the kingdom and, uh, and the kingdom over all nations and all languages would come and serve him. This figure is presented as someone who is both divine and eternal. They have the authority, which is very different than just a mere human of the Son of Man. So within this phrase, we see again the duality nature of Jesus, that he's just a man, he's the son of man. He lives, a, he lives life just like you and I did. But then within that phrase is this idea of this glorious, all-powerful being uh, as one. <clears throat> the next name we have is Emmanuel. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And a lot of people say, well, how come we don't worship Emmanuel then? Why is this, uh, why is this not his first name? Why isn't it Jesus, Emmanuel, Christ, or, or something like that? Why is it that not his name? 
And that's because people misunderstand uh, what this is talking about. He says Emmanuel means something, and it means God with us. This is not a name. This is another title of Jesus. We already looked at the name Jesus and what that meant. We've already looked at uh, these other titles. This is the same thing. This is really a title uh, that describes who he is, that he is uh, G- that he is God. And so from these four names that we've talked about up until this point, we see that God came down as a man, fully, completely human, and also fully, completely God. And his purpose was to come down and to, to save us from our sins, as we read in the name of Jesus. And so within these four names, this is all you need to know uh, uh, about God. Jesus, really, there's a lot, of, lot there. And you could probably spend an entire lesson on each one of these. Uh, but these four together have started painting a picture for us of what to expect in Jesus. So now as we go forward and we look at the role that he plays, we look at his kingship and the other things we're going to be looking at, we see that all of them come back to this idea of this uh, fully man, fully God uh, a person named Jesus who came to be able to take away the sins of the world. So we say the next title we want to look at is really looking at his authority and start to look at his kingship, and uh, that is Christ. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 16, it says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So uh, the word Christ here is the, really just the Greek word, the Greek version of the word Messiah. And it means the anointed one. The Christ is the chosen one. He has been anointed to be the savior of humanity. We also see within him the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of that prophet king who would be called Messiah. Just like the Son of Man was hearkening back to the Old Testament, so true, so too the name Christ or Messiah is the same thing. That Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies that looked forward to this prophet king who would be able to save his people. The next name that we have is very interesting to me, and that is the of the name Lord. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 11, it says and ev- that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, a lot of people go around today and they're willing to say, Jesus is Lord, but they have no clue what that means. And a lot of times we don't know what that means. What does it mean to say Jesus is Lord? If you are saying that Jesus is Lord in your life, what does that look like? What does that mean? Well, by us a better understanding what the word Lord is, we'll be able to understand a little bit more about what we are claiming with that phrase. The first we see that this, uh, this word kyrios is uh, the Greek word here for Lord. And uh, here, Lord, you know, in the Old Testament, was a general term that kind of meant that you were a master. Sometimes it meant you were a king. But this word kyrios was different because the, the, the translators translate them both Lord. But by the time you get to the Roman Empire, the word Lord meant something more than that. It meant something beyond just master or just a, a king. Because if you think about the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire had lots of kings. There was King Herod, there's all these governors and all this stuff. So you had to have something beyond king, and so they had an emperor. An emperor is Lord. So this is a king of kings. And also this term Lord was not only used to talk about the emperor, it was also used to talk about the the pantheon of gods that they had. that They called them lords as well. So you could use the language Lord to mean just a master or or a a king. But in the Roman Empire, it had this broader context to mean even divine ship, uh, divine uh, divinity, and then also uh, the emperor himself would be called Lord. So when we say that Jesus is our master, we say that we are saying that he or that he is Lord. We are saying that he is the king above all kings, that he is our emperor, our supreme leader, our supreme ruler, and even deity itself in the phrase Lord. Jesus must be our king and our God. 
We can have no other loyalties before him. That's what it means to call Jesus Lord. And if you say that Jesus is Lord and you do not hold him there, you're lying. You're being unfaithful. You're being untrue. You're betraying your king. How many people go around this world today saying Jesus is Lord, but then live their lives any way they want to as if they're not under uh, any kind of uh, kingship or uh, citizenship to a king or anything? Next, we have the phrase, the Son of God. In Mark chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What does the title, the Son of God, mean? Well, it means several things, and it does not mean that Jesus is, uh, that there is God over here completely separate, and there is Jesus over here, his Son, just like I have daughters, and you may have sons. It doesn't mean, it's not what that's talking about. Instead, rather, the term the Son of God is to try to help us understand an, uh, an infinite being. God is, is outside of time and space. God is eternal. He is infinite. And we have, tr our minds literally hurt when we try to think about those concepts. And so the Bible uses terminology to help us understand who Jesus is in relationship to God. So when we see and think of and hear the term, the Son of Man, we need to think about that relationship then. First of all, we see that it means that Jesus has a divine origin, that he is from God. And uh, next we see that he has a divine relationship. There is a unique relationship that no one else can have with God than his Son, the Son of God. It is completely unique, and no one will have that. You and I, as Christians, can be the adopted children of God, but we are not the Son of God. <clears throat> Next, it helps us also understand how deity, an eternal being, God, Jesus, part of the Godhead, could come down and be also fully man. How does that work? This makes no sense. Well, he also, so with this idea of the Son of God, we have the idea of how Possibly the incarnation of Christ or God becoming flesh, putting on flesh and being a man works. How does that exactly work? So it helps us understand. It helps paint a picture to show how God could become man. And so Jesus was not just a prophet, as the Muslims claim. He is not just a moral teacher, as many agnostics and atheists say, but rather he is God in human form. That's what it means when we ha have the phrase, the Son of God, that he is God in human form. The next phrase that we have is the Word. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We just talked about the deity of Jesus, but it's not always easy to understand this relationship with God the Father. Like I said, all of these terms, a lot of them are to help us understand a, a concept that is very difficult for us to understand. I don't know anybody walking around that has three personalities or three persons inside of one entity or one person. We, today we say that person's crazy because it's just, that's not normal for us. And yet we're trying to understand this eternal being that doesn't have a body, who's a spirit and has three personalities and they all do things separately but are one. How do, how do you understand these things? And so one of the ways the Bible helps us understand it is by calling Jesus the Word. And so it goes on to say that nothing was created at the beginning of time that was not created through Jesus. <clears throat> also, within himself, he is part of, the part of the God of the Godhead that is God's revelation to man. Jesus, you could say, is the divine part of God that is divine expression or a communication to mankind. It is the part of God that interacts with man, or excuse me, the part of God who interacts with man. See, it's very easy to, to make that mistake. In the Old Testament, there were uh, times the things that we call Christophanies, which are uh, the personhood of Jesus interacting with mankind before he took the body of Jesus. 
So this part of the, the Godhead was interacting with man, even in the Old Testament. And here in John chapter 1, it says, before time even began, he was there and interacting and doing things and creating. So uh, when we, it says, but then the word became flesh, and then now he represents God's will to mankind here on earth. And he took on the form of Jesus. The next title that we would like to talk about is the chief cornerstone. And this really begins our transition now to his authority, uh, away from his authority, but also to what he has accomplished. In Acts chapter 4, verse 11, it says, This is the stone which was rejected by the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Jesus, although rejected by the leadership of the Jews, is the foundation for Christianity. He is our focus. He is our purpose. As Bill uh, said so well in our prayer that when we come here, this is, he is the, the reason that we are here. Is the reason we gather around the Lord's table is to uh, think about him and to put him first in our lives and in our minds. He is the foundation for everything that we believe and everything that we are. The next title that we have of Jesus is the Lamb of God. In John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What does it mean to call Jesus the Lamb of God? Well, he tells us within this very context, the purpose of him being the Lamb of God is to take away the sins of the world. So instantly our minds should go back to a sacrificial lamb in the Old Testament that when you sinned against God, what you needed to do was go and sacrifice a pure lamb that's without spot, without blemish. And then you make that sacrifice and that, that, that blood that would be shed there, that life that would be taken, would, uh, in the least in the Old Testament, would push your sins forward. The God would not strike you dead right then as you deserved. But that's only the life of a, of, of a lamb. And, and yes, it's precious, and all life is precious, but it doesn't equal the human soul. And so instead, God gave us a lamb that would be worth not just one human soul, but all human souls in the form of Jesus. So this symbolizes Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, highlighting his atonement for the sins of the world and the ultimate sacrifice of redemption that he has provided for each and every one of us. Next we see that Jesus is also, in addition to being the sacrificial lamb, he is also the high priest. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So not only is Jesus the sacrifice for our sins, but he is also the one that is, uh, that is offering the same sacrifice up to God. And he's playing all, all the roles, if you will. And so what this is talking about, the reason Jesus can do this is because he has established a new covenant. He is not from the tribe of Levi, who were the only ones who were allowed to participate this in the Old Testament. And so the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that a new covenant has been established, a, a, a new priesthood has been established, of which Jesus is the high priest and you and I are priests also. And that's just amazing. It's not just one part or a group of people who are priests, but we are all priests if we are Christians. Which means that all of us now can go through Jesus and ask God for forgiveness of our sins. And because the lamb has already been sacrificed, we don't need to have, offer sacrifice again. All we need to do is to pray to God through Jesus and ask for the forgiveness of our sins. And Jesus is standing there at the side of God saying, listen, I was fully man, along with being fully God, and I understand the pain and the suffering and the struggle it is to fight against sin, and he is our advocate. We, we didn't put that one up here this morning, but he's also our advocate, the Bible says, to, say, to ask God to forgive us of our sins. It's so uh, absolutely amazing. And I'll say we probably left at least half the names of the Bible that the Bible has for Jesus out because it would have just been too long of a lesson. And they cover a lot of the same territory. But it's just amazing all the God that Jesus has done for us. 
The next one is that he is the author and finisher of our faith. And I really like this one because we, we basically almost already just said that. That he is both the lamb, the sacrifice, and he is also the one, uh, the high priest. And the, here it basically sums, summarizes that. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is both the author, he started it, he was there at the beginning, he was the word, he brought uh, the world and the universe that we see into existence, and then also on the cross, uh, he has, was the sacrifice for our sins. And of course, through his resurrection, we have a, a promise of a resurrection if we are faithful to God as well. He is both the beginning and the end of our faith. He is the focus of our faith, and he, it is because of him that we have salvation. But because of that, there is also another side to this. In John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Because Jesus is the beginning and the end, the author and the finisher, because he is the focus point, there is no way to get to heaven except through Jesus. There are a lot of nice people out there in the world. But they're not going to heaven. Because Jesus is the only way to get to God. He is the way, the truth, and the way to life. In John 11, verse 25, it says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Everyone is going to die. There's going to be an end to all things. But there's going to be a life after in which you will have a, a, a heavenly body and be in heaven with God forever and, have a, a, and be eternal or immortal. That only occurs, that promise of heaven only occurs through Jesus. It is only those who are in Jesus that will have this life and this resurrection. The Bible says that those who do not have this have a resurrection of damnation. It is not to a new wonderful life. <clears throat> and so because of this, Jesus is the light of the world. His message, the good news, is shining out into this lost and dying and dark world of people who don't know that without Jesus, without turning towards Jesus, there is no hope. There is no way to heaven except through Jesus, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. In John 8, verse 12, it says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. If we're going to follow Jesus, then we also need to be the light of the world. We are a light shining on a hill, <laughs> spreading forth the message of Jesus. Where he is also called Rabbi. And now we talk a little bit more about the things that he has done in, in guiding us. And that's kind of the, the idea of the light of the world too, that he is that beacon which we look to. In John chapter 1, verse 38, it says, Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, what do, you do, what, uh, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated teacher, where are you staying? Jesus is our teacher. A disciple is a follower of Christ. We, are, we study him, we study his life, the things that he taught, the people who followed him, what they said that he taught them. We study those things and we make them part of who we are so that we have that light. He needs to be our teacher. If Jesus is not your teacher, then you are not a disciple because that's what it means to be a disciple, that we are a student of Jesus. We also find that he is called the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, verse 11, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his, his life for the sheep. Jesus died on the cross so that everyone's sins could be washed away. Could be. 
The Bible says that God desires that no one should be lost. But when it comes down to it, the only ones that will take advantage of that wonderful blessing of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ are those who are his sheep, are those who are his followers. And that sacrifice is going to be nothing to all those who rejected it. But to those who accept it, he is the shepherd. And that means he is the guide. You know, the word shepherd here is where we get... Uh, well, I'll, I'll simplify things. You know, we often talk about the elders of the church, they're the leaders of the church. And the Bible says that he is the, the chief shepherd. That's because Jesus is the one who guides this church. I don't guide this church. Bill doesn't guide this church. I can say like, uh, like the Apostle Paul, follow me as I follow Jesus. But in the end, it's Jesus who we're following. He is the one who's guiding this church. He is the one that is directing this church. He is the one that tells us what we are, how we are to live our lives, how we're supposed to preach our gospel. All of these things come from God, come from Jesus, and come from the Bible. Next we find the title, The King of the Jews. And so we want to look finally as we close this, this morning about the eternal reign and kingship of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 37, it says, And they put up, uh, up over his head the accusation written against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. This is the description that was placed above him at his crucifixion. And again, it is highlighting his uh, kingship as the Messiah, as the King of the Jews. And for us today, this is, again is fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies that he would be that king. But that means that he is our king. There's a, there's a president that we have here in this land. And people like to say, oh, he's not my president, whoever, they, they don't agree with the president. Well, he's the president of the land in which I live, but he is not my king. He is not the one that directs my life. He's not the one that decides how I live my life. He's not the one that tells me how to go and what, what to do and how to behave. Jesus is. And what Jesus, what King Jesus says, goes first before any law of this land. And I judge all the laws and the decisions and the thoughts of this land, not by my own wisdom or what I think or what I like, but by Jesus. Because he is my king. And in him I have citizenship. Not only is he my king, he's also the Alpha and the Omega. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. If you don't think that Jesus is God, then read this verse. How could Jesus be anything other than God making this claim? We already read that he was there in the beginning with God, the word was God. But he says, I'm also going to be there in the end. He says, and everything in between. He is the Almighty. He is God. Which means in addition to being my king and directing my paths here in this life, he also is worthy of my worship as my God, as the creator. And he definitely deserves uh, my devotion to him and my obedience to him. If he, was, if he was just the king of king and the emperor of all that is, that'd be pretty amazing. But he's also the creator and the beginning of the end in addition to that. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, he is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. It says, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. This is talking about, we talked about how Jesus uh, was the lamb, that he sacrificed himself for us, that he was the author and finisher of our faith, and now we're looking at the other side of that. The final outcome of that is he is the, also the lion, which means that he is the, uh, it talks about the root of David, so talking about his kingship here, but also the lion of the tribe of Judah is talking about him being victorious. That he is that powerful, prideful lion that nothing can compete against. 
the, uh, the walks, the, the savannah, unchallenged. That's the idea here, the strength and the royalty and the authority and the victory of Jesus. In Revelation 22, verse 16, it said, calls Jesus the morning star. It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, again, calling back to his kingship, the bright and morning star. I, I absolutely love this title for Jesus. If you've ever been camping or been someplace and you've been up all night and it gets kind of scary out there sometimes. I know one of the, the things we in Boy Scouts always used to do is try to scare each other in the middle of the night, make them think there's bears there or something. And uh, it worked pretty good. I, Ryan stayed awake all night one night because he thought it was a bear outside. And I'll tell you, there are times you wake up and you're like, what time is it? Is it, is it morning yet? Like, oh, it's only midnight. It's only three o'clock. It's only four o'clock. When is the morning going to come? And you're impatiently waiting for it. That's who Jesus is. He is that light that you are so very thankful for after the darkness of the night. Because you know that the day is coming. That's who Jesus is. Our God and our King, and He is ever victorious. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, it says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. Jesus is also the judge at the end of time. The good thing is that he is called faithful and true. The Bible says that God judges him partially. And that he is, we already know as we read earlier that he is going to have victory over his war. The Bible tells us that the last uh, the enemy of his that will be conquered is death. And everything will be put under his footstool, that he will be uh, the ruler over all, except for of God the Father, of course. And in righteousness he judges, and he is faithful and true. It kind of sums up everything that we need to know. Jesus is faithful. And all that we've talked about is true and that it's not going to change. And we can literally bet our souls on it. As a matter of fact, we ask that you bet your soul on it. That's what God asks us to do. We are asked that we need to hear his word. Jesus is the author and the finisher of faith. It is literally his word. We are told to put our trust in him. He says we, he is trustworthy, even to the end of time. And by putting our trust in him, that means that we're going to believe in him, that we're going to be loyal to him, that we're going to say Jesus is Lord and mean it and know what that means, that he directs our lives. That we must submit to Jesus in repentance, that we are putting his will, his, his thoughts first. His goals first, and we're going to submit ourselves and stop living for ourselves, but live uh, the way that God would ask us to. And of course, we're going to be able to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah, that He is the Christ, that He is King, that He is God. All of these titles, that He is Wonderful and Counselor, Almighty God, how wonderful that is. And the whole world needs to know this. It is part of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And finally, we're going to submit to his plan of salvation, his death, burial, and resurrection through baptism so that we can be, arise in a newness of life and be part of the kingdom of God, be the part of the family of God. All of these relationships that we as Christians have that nobody else has ever had that are uh, uh, absolutely amazing, the relationship that we can have, it's because of Jesus, because of the work that Jesus has done. And so, in the end, all we need to do after we follow this plan of salvation is to faithfully follow our King. The Bible says that He is faithful. What about us? Are we faithful to our citizenship, to our King?
to the kingdom of which we are a part of. This morning, maybe you are not, maybe you have not understood Jesus the right way and you have not treated him the right way. We have a loving and merciful God who has done all of this for you and for me. And he's given us today one more day. The Bible says the reason the sun rises, and we can thank Jesus for that. We can thank him for the day that we have. And so we need to uh, ask him for, for forgiveness of our sins and continue to live faithfully. Maybe you're one of either case. If you are, we ask that you please come while we stand and sing the song of invitation. Almost persuaded.